here we go. All right, so, and uh, let's start with the Okay, good again good morning timothy and thank you for not running away i know that you have your shoes on your dancing shoes obviously so this was really um great i'm i'm working on my moves every week yes i can see that you're getting better and better and uh, well so uh, without uh, much delay i think that we can start now great so, Maya, you know that uh, we had the uh, state funeral for uh, former Ambassador Abe. In fact, uh, you were there, actually, in the, in the neighborhood as that funeral was going on. Um, you saw thousands of people streaming into the Budokan and around the diet uh, compound. Um, lots of protesters, but they were far outnumbered by the people who came to pay their respects. As yes. I guess you were there, too, for that, right? <laughs> right. Yes, I happened to be in the in the neighborhood at that time. And yes, it was really uh, fascinating to see the number of people who were uh, going into the Budokan. And uh, yes, they all of them were just peacefully um, moving into the that direction. They, they, they were having flowers and everything. Right. And there yeah. was as you said yes the people who were against demonstrating demonstrating against it they actually were very peaceful too so yeah, yeah. It's... so we we should talk just a little bit about it because for the last three weeks we've been talking every week about the state funeral and the costs and how the prime minister kind of dastardly orchestrated this so that it could boost his numbers which were really down and uh, there was a lot of criticism lodged at him. Um, the state funeral did go on without a hitch. Uh, more than uh, 218 countries and international organizations were represented. There were more than 700 uh, foreign dignitaries that came, including prime ministers, the prime minister of South Korea, um, Australia, the vice president of the United States um, uh, were here. Uh, uh, just a, a whole phalanx of people. If you were here and driving around town, all of the hotels were, were solidly, solidly booked and uh, the motorcades were really disrupting traffic on uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then by Wednesday, things began to, to die down. But for people who are listening in on the, this broadcast, this briefing, you already know the background of why uh, this was such a big deal and how Mr. Abe was assassinated and the roots of that. And the roots of that were his um, involvement with the Unification Church and the Unification Church's um, involvement in Japanese politics, particularly in LDP politics. They did a bit of a self-organized um, um, uh, examination of that run by the um, the LDP on all of the members in the LDP, what their role was, how much they received, if they did receive any funding or if they received uh, help or assistance in their election campaigns or if they spoke at these different rallies. That actually um, didn't go as planned. It, it began to backfire a little bit. <clears throat> there was a day maybe two weeks ago where everybody was supposed to submit their description of their um, involvement with the Unification Church. So if, if you characterize the Unification Church as kind of notorious, it, it is not inaccurate now. Even though it's a religious organization, it was very much under the, um, the radar um, before the assassination, it has flipped and become really a, a, a pariah. And everybody is distancing themselves from it. So they were all of the LDP members were um, uh, required to submit a document <clears throat> that described their involvement. 
and a promise that they were going to disengage with uh, the Unification Church. Um, it really began to uh, snowball and, and start another controversy because there were uh, several significant individuals who left off of the obligation to submit that. And one was uh, Mr. Hosoda, who was the faction leader of the Abe faction. So it was the Hosoda faction for about uh, six years. And then it transitioned to become the Abe faction after, Mr. after the election of Mr. Kishida. Mr. Kishida became prime minister. Mr. Hosoda became speaker of the house. And then Mr. Abe became the uh, leader of the uh, Abe, it became the Abe faction, uh, the Sewai Ken, um, the largest faction in uh, LDP politics, uh, 98 members as of today, uh, compared to the second uh, in rank, which has uh, 58. So it's it, there's a big gap between first place, second place, third place, fourth place. And um, so, uh, Mr. Hosoda was uh, removed from that because he was Speaker of the House and therefore he has nothing to do with the LDP. So we're leaving him off. Although all indications are that the Sewakai, uh, the Hosoda faction, the Abe faction, was the one that was most instrumental in allowing the Unification Church to exercise its influence. So uh, they've done, you know, uh, several analysis of the, the members of the parliament, uh, the large majority of the LDP, although there were other people in the uh, Constitutional Democratic Party who also had ties with uh, uh, the Unification Church. And um, Mr. Hosoda was left off of that. So now that the state funeral is over, the investigations are continuing, and he actually had to admit um, his involvement with the Unification Church. This is a big deal now because the Diet will go into session tomorrow, on Monday, for a, a two-month session to do a couple of things, but one of the things the opposition party is hell bent on is to embarrass Mr. Hosoda and the LDP, drag down deliberations so that the 20 or so bills that Mr. Kishida said he would like to consider and pass into law during this extraordinary session is, um, is confounded by the opposition. So that's the first person whose name kind of came out and was left off the original list. And the second one was Mr. Abe, Mr. Shinzo Abe himself. And the explanation given by the LDP was that um, since he's dead, we really can't confirm or uh, really run due diligence on that. But in fact, I think uh, the um, stated or the common knowledge is that he was very instrumental in uh, encouraging or, or having the LDP Sewakai um, really uh, facilitate the Unification Church's uh, contributions to Japanese politics. I mean, several of the people, remember there was, at the death of Mr. Abe, there was a, a coalition of LDP um, bigwigs, six of them, who were going to uh, run Sewakai in the interim, or maybe pick a, a leader out of that, that group. And that was not successful because everybody wanted to become the leader. So of the six, they couldn't decide. But in the meantime, uh, of the six, uh, three of them, maybe four, uh, were identified as really close, having close ties with the Unification Church. So uh, they fell out of uh, consideration. And the Sewakai said, I know all of you that have been on this briefing before, I've heard this um, maybe two or three times, but the, the, the coalition of leaders said, we're not going to make a decision until after the state funeral. State funeral was, you know, five days ago. So you can anticipate that there is going to be um, real shifting now. Alliances will be, or they have been built. There'll be action that'll be taken now. And I think Japanese politics is headed for a very tumultuous period. So that's what we're going to talk about today. There are other geopolitical things going on, but uh, just as an opening, and I've been going on for five minutes, just about the, the state funeral and the Unification Church, Mr. Hosoda, it just, it's, it's rather complicated. It takes a bit of time to explain it, but the implications and the repercussions of that are going to play themselves out over the next maybe three weeks. It's, it's not going to be so quick, but it is um, inescapable that there's going to be uh, some, some great repercussions going on here. So um, let me go to um, some of the points that I'd like to discuss today so that we can roll over 
and go into the Q&A that will be exclusively on Clubhouse. So if you're only listening on on LinkedIn, um, please sign up for Clubhouse if you're that interested. But if not, um, you know, Maya is uploading this briefing onto YouTube as well. So pick it up when you can. So um, Comato has a, uh, a coalition with the LDP. We all know that. It provides votes, it provides a, a continuity, it makes the LDP a stronger political force. Many people have asked me, um, and if you're into Japanese politics and your friends know about that, they constantly ask you too, how come the LDP is so strong? How come nobody can shake the LDP out of power? And um, the answer there is because they are the largest, they have the most experience in running a government. There was a very brief example when the opposition party came in and attempted to run the government, they just didn't have the wherewithal, they didn't have the acumen, they didn't have the experience, and things fell apart very quickly. Not only that, but you had the, um, you know, the disasters of of uh, uh, Fukushima as well. So um, Komeito is a, a critical part of the LDP factions, um, the LDP party uh, running the, the Japanese government. And when they run elections, uh, they do it in concert with each other. And that that coalition, that, that bond is beginning to shake a little bit and there are signs of that. So one of the signs, um, my, am I okay on um, bandwidth? Am I being spotty here? Are you no, here? you're fine. Good, uh, so I you. just got a, a little bit of a beep there. So um, with the coalition, uh, Mr. Um, Yamaguchi is the chairman of the Komeito. He was just re-elected for his seventh term as the leader of Komeito. That's a pretty big deal. Mr. Kishida went to the party where he was um, celebrating that. It was a big deal. It was in the newspapers, on television. They did the, the fist bump and congratulations like that. But the, the relationship between the two, between particularly Mr. Kishida and Mr. Yamaguchi is not so great. Previously, under the Abe administration, um, Mr. Nikai, who was the Secretary General of the LDP, had a very strong relationship with the Komeito um, party. And there were a couple of people that were instrumental in keeping that relationship going, sharing information. When issues came up, they were able to solve them quietly behind the scenes. The people who were in that kind of um, mix are largely gone. Mr. Abe is gone. Mr. Nikai is really not um, involved in uh, the central part of the Kishida administration. So the, the relationship, the communications channel between the current administration and the Komeito is not very strong. And uh, there are some problems that are looming. Number one, Japan or the Kishida administration wants to expand the defense budget from 1% to 2%. And this is not altogether acceptable to Komeito. That's the first one. The second one is that the um, supplementary budget, you remember when Mr. Kishida was first elected, he passed a, a tremendous budget. I think it was, um, um, what was it? It was like 42 a trillion yen. It was just astounding what he, he passed as a budget. And that was eight months ago. Um, so um, the way he spends the money is not really commensurate with what Komeito wants. Komeito wants more social services, more support for the, the poor and, and people who are living on uh, pensions, that sort of thing. And he doesn't always get his way. So uh, that is coming up again. There is another supplemental budget that will be considered uh, in this session that starts tomorrow. And already there, the battle lines are being drawn. There's another complication here in that um, Komeito had an agreement with Ishin in Osaka that um, they would kind of counterbalance each other. I won't run a candidate against you in this district, and you're not going to run a candidate against me in another district. That's not an LDP discussion. That's a, a discussion with Ishin, which is in the opposition. They're, they're very, uh, philosophically, they're very close to the LDP. But Komeito had this kind of relationship with them. They're not going to do that. And as a consequence of that, or an added consequence of that, uh, the LDP, many LDP members in uh, the Kansai region lost their seats to Ishin members. So Ishin really uh, cleaned up in this last election. And that agreement now lapses. It will lapse uh, this month. 
So what happens in the next election, Cometo is not bound by that, uh, that relationship, by that agreement. And what remains to be seen is what happens between Cometo and Ishin going forward. This relationship between LDP and Cometo is good because Cometo always gets a cabinet portfolio out of that. That's a huge deal for, uh, for Cometo. Um, but this, this thing with the Unification Church is a, a, a counterbalance to the relationship between the LDP and Cometo. Cometo is a kind of a, um, it's a political party with the backing of a religious organization called Sokagakai. I think we all know about that. So the Unification Church was similarly, although maybe 15 or 20 years behind what Sokagakai did to create a political arm and a, then a political party, and then have this relationship with the LDP, the Unification Church saw that as a model and was building towards that rather successfully, um, it, it appears. I mean, that's what the Fuhrer is over, that they were growing so quickly and kind of kind of really pushing the, the levers on generating more cash so they can actually be more active. And that's the trigger that started the, um, you know, the downfall of, of Mr. Abe, because he was identified as supporting the Unification Church, this young man whose mother gave away the family inheritance. He had no other way. He had written letters. He had appealed to the LDP. He had gone to people to try and seek some sort of a justification of, on his issues. It really didn't go anywhere. And in frustration, uh, he reached out. It, Mr. Abe wasn't his first target, but it was the most uh, obvious one during the election campaign. So what's going on with Cometo, with Ishin, with the LDP is very, very pregnant with what's going on now. Um, so it's something to watch. It will probably be kind of quietly. We will observe it and, and report on it to you, but it won't be coming out in the open until there is um, some fist fights uh, going on in the diet. And potentially, um, you know, Mr. Uh, Kishida uh, closing the diet session. Um, and closing the house for elections. At this point in time, it is a possibility. It's not a high possibility, but um, we reported on Mr. Kishida's uh, uh, poll numbers last week. So those numbers come out once a month. Um, so we don't have poll numbers to report now, but they were really bad last, um, last week when we reported on them. Then we have the state funeral. So the state funeral is supposed to prop him up He's meeting with lots of foreign dignitaries, and um, hopefully for him, his numbers are increasing. But now we've got uh, the diet session that starts tomorrow, and the opposition parties are loaded for bear. They're going to criticize him and his administration for the state funeral, for the fact that the uh, state paid for that funeral, and that the costs were just beyond what Mr. Kishida initially said that they would be. And the second thing they're going to hit them with is the Unification Church and the fact Mr. Hosoda, he's the Speaker of the House. We're having our, our diet session right now. And the president right here, he was involved with the Unification Church, too. So we want an explanation. So there's, there's plenty to be fighting about. One of the um, goals of the uh, administration is in this diet session, it's going to be two months. It will close in December, is to pass a supplemental budget. And there's plenty to fight about there. Uh, Mr. Kishida is, um, is committed to passing a supplemental budget so that he can jigger up the um, new capitalism and also start up the economy and uh, help facilitate uh, the beds and the hospital uh, reaction to COVID. But he wants to push that kind of the, the COVID response a little bit down because now it's open borders for tourists. So on October 11th, he will actually talk about this. So the reason why the diet is not going to, I don't anticipate a whole lot happening this week is because the first day of the diet, uh, the prime minister will make a policy speech, a very um, important, a very long policy speech full of details of what he intends to do, what his administration stands for, what he's learned over these last eight months, and what he plans to do moving forward. Very demonstrable um, action plans. Um, he's been criticized as kind of a lot of talk and not a lot of action. So this speech is really uh, geared to be, uh, you know, pr pretending a lot of action that, that's supposed to come up. So well, I don't anticipate a whole lot happening this week. You will be seeing the signs of um, uh, controversy and uh, dissension, uh, but that will probably roll out uh, next week. And 
Yeah, if it if it gets worse, um, yeah, the the prime minister could become frustrated uh, if his numbers come back and uh, they look much better as a result of the state funeral and as a result of the supplemental budget that he's considering and his speech tomorrow. Um, the numbers could come up and he could say, "Okay, well, uh, screw you guys. I'm going to close down the house. We're going to have elections again, and uh, you guys can suffer uh, the results of that because I'm on the upswing." I kind of don't think so. But I think um, he will be fraught with a lot of difficulty in this next diet session. So um, uh, there's a lot to look forward to. Um, there's a lot going on with um, with him as well. Um, you know, uh, the the United States uh, sent Kamala Harris to uh, to Japan. She was in Asia for four days. Almost three of those days were spent in in Japan. Um, she made uh, a pretty big splash with the prime minister, but she was rather low key um, in, in making press announcements. And then from Tokyo, she went to uh, South Korea, where she had a little bit more press there. Interestingly, um, as she left Washington, uh, North Korea fired two uh, rockets, um, short range ballistic missiles that landed within the uh, Sea of Japan, but nowhere close to Japan's exclusive economic zone, which is a, a key factor, a key trigger. But as she left Washington, D.C., they fired two missiles. And this is always not only just to test um, their, their capabilities. I mean, it is done for a, a logical reason, but it's also done to send a message. She went to um, uh, uh, South Korea. She visited the DMZ. She made a couple of statements. And within uh, less than 48 hours, she was back. And before, she, um, I think as she, she left, uh, as the, the planes were out of uh, the, the region's um, uh, airspace, uh, North Korea fired yet another rocket. So that's three rockets in a span of one week. And this is uh, pretty alarming. It's pretty alarming in light of everything else that's going on. So typically, uh, Taiwan, China, there's a lot of action going on here. This last week, it was rather calm. Um, the 50th anniversary of Japan-China relations was held this week, and that might explain some of it, but boy, was it active in Europe. And uh, I don't need to go into to much detail there. You've already known about the you know, annexation uh, by uh, Vladimir Putin of the, the four districts of Ukraine that are now uh, Russian territory, the uh, Nordstrom uh, gas uh, rupture, um, what's going on in Iran. Uh, there's a lot of things going on there. China, Taiwan will probably rise again. Um, but Yasuo Fukuda was the chair of this um, conference, this committee for um, celebrating 50 years. His father was instrumental in doing that. His father, um, Takeo Fukuda, uh, prime minister of Japan, he lost his fight to Tanaka. Kind of uh, one of the, the issues there was establishing relationships uh, with Taiwan, with China, you know, distancing themselves from Taiwan. Mr. Uh, uh, Kakue Tanaka became foreign minister as a result of that. But the Fukuda family, and the Fukuda family is, uh, once again, it's Sewakai. It's the, it was the Fukuda faction for so many years. So the Sewakai, one of the largest, one of the oldest um, political factions within the LDP, is still engaged in, in that kind of diplomacy. And so What's to be um, said about U.S., um, about China, Japan relations is uh, rather an open book. You might remember that before COVID, um, maybe three months before COVID actually came out, uh, China was supposed to have a state visit here in Japan. There, all the preparations were underway and it, it stopped dead, um, not just because of COVID. There were some other issues going on, but we were so close to having a state visit here. Can you even imagine now, can you picture a state visit under current circumstances? It's just, it's almost something you can't even um, accommodate because the tensions are so high. Uh, it's unlikely that um, the, the premier of China would travel out of, out of China. I mean, he did go to Uzbekistan to meet with Vladimir Putin about a month ago, uh, but it is unlikely that he would travel much further than that. Uh, so a lot is going on on that end, too. And geopolitically, what's going on in Russia, what's going on in Ukraine, Iran, 
uh, Uzbekistan. There's some, some hot conflict going on there. Uh, it's really worrisome. And I've got to say that, and I made this point uh, maybe two weeks ago, that the pace of change has increased so remarkably that in, just in staying on top of it and, and selecting the news sources to listen to, to pay attention to, because there's just a lot of bad information, false information, misinformation that's going out. And I think, um, you know, our audience is, is rather sophisticated. And I think um, it's not me that's um, uh, stating kind of the obvious. Other people are doing the same thing. There are, there are two tracks of information that are going on, and there are actually uh, two layers. Uh, most of us are only aware of layer number one, but there's another layer going on that really is, is uh, controlling and dictating what happens on layer uh, number two, uh, the one that, that we observe and, and report on and are able to uh, analyze. So it's, it's important to keep your, um, your information sources, to run your own do, due diligence, and to listen to what's going on. The pace of change is, is just remarkable. When we talk about that, we talk also about uh, the yen, the yen value, uh, the Japanese government. It's kind of um, difficult for the, the prime minister. He would like the yen to be stronger, but when it's weak, uh, foreign tourists coming into Japan it's kind of a bonanza for them. So actually, the government is promoting tourism to Japan because the yen is so cheap. So come, Japan used to be known as being very expensive, the hotels, the food, but it's cheap now, come on. So they're really uh, putting it on afterburners. The opening gate will be, you can already see that there are foreigners coming in, but I think the opening gate will be on uh, October 11th. He will talk about that tomorrow in his presentation. He expects, they've, they've talked about this uh, openly, they expect um, the foreigners coming into Japan uh, to um, pump about 5 trillion yen into the economy. That's rather ambitious because um, it was 4.8 before COVID, and that was with the inclusion of many of the Chinese. You, you'll remember that there was a lot of criticism that the Chinese were going to Kyoto and clogging the streets, and they didn't have good manners, and then they would buy all of the goods from uh, the, the tax-free uh, shops, and they would go back on the airplanes. That's good. Uh, I think just the numbers um, caused a little bit of, of um, consternation. But they're not going to have that this time. I think uh, fewer Chinese will be coming to Japan, even though uh, the doors will be open to them. But the Japanese government is anticipating five trillion uh, yen to be pumped into the economy. So they're going full bore on that. You will be noticing a lot more foreigners, if you haven't already, uh, in town and in the outskirts, too. I mean, uh, there's lots to see. And the, the Japanese government is guiding people to lots of different destinations, not just, um, you know, Tokyo. Osaka and Kyoto. Let's see what else we've got. Um, uh, uh, once again, with, with North Korea, there are a couple of things that are going on uh, defense-wise with Japan. Uh, we reported a little bit on it last week. There was a uh, German uh, warship, a frigate, that visited Japanese waters uh, and did exercises here with the Japanese um, mil um, maritime forces for months on end over the summer. And now this has kind of morphed into the Air Force. And so the, uh, the Germans sent over a, uh, um, a force of maybe three or four Eurojet fighters. Uh, they spent uh, maybe three weeks here on joint exercises. It's a pretty big deal. I mean, even though it's just uh, three aircraft, it does include, you know, tankers for refueling, support staff, maybe 200 uh, support staff. And they're just finishing exercises uh, here in Japan, flying back to Europe. But um, the, the discussions between Japan and Germany are becoming more and more robust. There is talks of having a joint plan for a uh, air fighter uh, that would be uh, jointly developed. That's a, a really big deal. Um, and in, at the same time that that's happening, uh, the United States, uh, South Korea, Japan have been conducting anti-submarine drills in the Sea of Japan. And this is a very big deal. The North Korean leader um, in the UN last week lambasted the United States for kind of saber rattling and, and doing these pr provocative acts. Uh, one of the things that the Japanese are extremely good at is anti-submarine warfare. 
They're not so good at the submarines. They've tried to sell submarines um, to Australia. They weren't very successful there. They're having a hard time um, bolstering the defense industry here. They're going to spend more money so that they would, they would like to have a lot of that based on the industry here. But because of the Constitution, they're not really, they don't have the depth. They don't have the, the tooling. They don't have the, the experienced staff. Uh, the South Koreans don't have the hindrance of having a constitution like that. And in fact, their enemy is right across the border. So their defense um, industry is very robust. S the problem is trying to share information and um, buy product uh, from, from South Korea. They're even having trouble. They've complained with um, to Camilla Harris when she was visiting that the rules and regulations on electric vehicles um, disentangle incentivizes uh, South Koreans uh, manufacturers from selling uh, EVs in the United States. This is a big issue there. So they can't even solve that one. Um, the, the, the defense industry is just even more um, complicated. So the, I, I anticipate that most of the defense spending uh, that Japan needs to do on advanced weapon systems that they don't have the cap capability to, to generate internally will be purchased from the United States. And that's why the budget needs to be, you know, 100% more than it is right now. There's a lot going on defense-wise. Okinawa, just um, the uh, um, defense minister, Hayashi uh, uh, Hamada, visited with um, Denny Tamaki just this last week. It's the first time for the defense minister, Hamada, to visit Okinawa. Uh, it, it's the, you know, Mr. Uh, Denny Tamaki just won his gov gubernatorial election uh, two weeks ago, we reported on that here, and he is opposed to the movement of the Marine base from Fatema to uh, the spit of land, um, Henako. And so there's a big controversy there. The um, Ministry of the Minister of Defense went there to encourage the governor to reconsider his options, probably dangling, you know, um, tourism dollars, you know, economic development, a little bit more money. Okinawa is the poorest of all 47 prefectures, as you know. It really is suffering. It could use a little bit more um, attention from uh, the, the central government. It is not getting it, particularly because of this controversy. Uh, the central government wants to be able to fulfill the, the agreement it has with the United States on basing soldiers and weapon systems in Okinawa. And of course, the governor, having just won another four-year term, is adamant. He's saying, you know, why don't you uh, spend a little bit more money here and send a lot of these soldiers um, elsewhere in Japan? And of course, the uh, the geopolitical explanation for that is because Okinawa is closest to uh, where all of the action will be if action indeed happens. That actually isn't 100% uh, true because the prime minister just made a statement this last week. By the way, did you know that a, um, uh, a consular official from the, um, uh, the Japanese government in Vladivostok was uh, detained as, as uh, conducting spy activities. This was on uh, Wednesday. He was arrested, apparently beaten up, uh, treat, treated uh, very um, brusquely by uh, the Russians, um, handcuffed and put into a very severe um, uh, situation. Um, the Japanese government sprung him. He was kicked out of the country, but he was accused of spying. Um, this is unusual. The, the Japanese uh, rarely are put in that kind of a situation. But very soon after that, the prime minister made an a interesting remark about the Northern Territories Islands, something you haven't heard very much about. Under Abe, you've heard about the Northern Territories, the four islands that were occupied by the Soviet Union right at the end of of uh, World War II. They occupied those, they excluded all the Japanese there. And there's been no peace treaty signed between uh, Russia and Japan as a consequence of that occupation. The prime minister just went on the record this last week and said, you are occupying illegally our four islands up in the north. This is, this is uh, I mean, if you're Putin, you, you know, you're dealing with you know, uh, Poland and the United States and, and Ukraine, and all of a sudden you got somebody on your back door saying, you've occupied our islands illegally, like you're doing with Ukraine and the four provinces that you've just taken over. We want, you know, we want to, to resolve this issue. Under Mr. Abe, he spent 
um, I mean, he was with um, Vladimir Putin 22 times. They visited one on one to talk about how to resolve this issue. He didn't make much headway. And this is a signal that under Mr. Kishida, he's going to he's going to change that that strategy. I can't imagine that that's done internally within the LDP solely at Mr. Kishida's uh, intuition. Uh, Mr. Kishida is less hawkish than Mr. Abe was, and even Mr. Abe was on an appeasement with uh, strategy with uh, Mr. Putin. Having Mr. Kishida come up with this, it's kind of out of character, and all you can uh, imagine is that there's a grander plan being designed by the United States and getting getting um, Japan uh, fully engaged, fully involved, so that we can counterbalance not just what, what is going on potentially between China and Taiwan, but also what's going on with the uh, with the Russians and, and that sort of thing. Vladivostok, um, very few people know about it. It's less than an hour flight from Tokyo. It is like a Euro European city just on the coast uh, facing the Japan seaside. It is a beautiful city. I wish there was more tourism there, but um, yes, that is the, uh, the Far East uh, capital for what the uh, for what the the Russians are uh, w the Russian nation is the largest uh, you know land country in in the world so there's a lot going on there and something to keep your eye on i anticipate that there will be more actions coming on that uh, the yen you might remember um, the japanese government um, after 20 years actually intervened in the yen uh, maybe 10 days ago on a Thursday, then, then we went into a three-day weekend, if you recall. Then we had the state funeral. So this is the first time for action, us to actually talk about that in much detail. Um, the yen hit the psychological barrier of 145 10 days ago, 12 days ago. And the Bank of Japan acknowledged uh, that there needed to be some intervention to prevent it going from 145 to 146. It shocked the the um, the the um, the stock market. So they intervened. They intervened somewhat independently without um, clearing it or without getting the accommodation of other of the G6 uh, countries. Um, they didn't apparently get uh, buy in from uh, the Federal Reserve or Janet Yellen or what was going on in uh, in England. Um, and as predicted, uh, the yen fell down. So I was watching it very carefully last week. It went down to 144, not a huge dip, 140. Three top four, 143, and it is now back to the place that it was two weeks ago. So um, economists did predict that it's it's just spitting into the wind. It's not going to have that much of an effect, but they needed to do something. And I've got to, I've got to to believe that um, it is not the end. You're going to see uh, more of this. The yen is going to go uh, even lower, um, and it's going to happen um, over a a period of time, it could be um, very quickly. So the thing to watch is on Mondays, um, Mondays when the stock market opens again, Monday nights in the United States, um, if there's going to be a, a, a fall or, or something uh, precipitous, it usually has signals on Thursday and Friday, and then the markets recalibrate. And then on Monday, it comes back with a vengeance. That's what's happened with all of the, the falls. And it looks like um, uh, we are headed towards some sort of a recalibration, not just um, in the United States. The United States has its own problems, but it has its own strengths too. But with Japan and England, England is under a new government now, and um, they're doing tax cuts and um, uh, economic stimulus uh, as well. They're doing it a little bit differently than Japan is, but the, the indicators are not looking particularly favorable for England. A lot of people are watching Japan because Japan is not following the rest of the team. They're, they have a very uh, loose monetary policy. And as a consequence of that, the yen is falling in value. So um, uh, costs are high, um, food costs are high, and many of the restrictions on price increases implemented by the Kishida administration lapsed in September. He extended them until the end of December. So we're in that phase now. But as I told you last week, there are more than 5,000 food products that will have price increases this month. Compared to what happened in September and August, there were maybe um, you know uh, hundreds, maybe thousands, a couple of thousand food products 
that increased in October, in uh, uh, August, and in September. But now this is 5,000, almost 6,000, and that will increase, and people will get more and more upset. Mr. Kishida must do something about enhancing the wages of the uh, employees so that there's more robustness in the economy. It's a, it's, I, I think he, he really has acknowledged he can't do it, so he's going to be giving money away and keeping prices low by paying um, subsidies. So that doesn't go on very long. There has to be something bigger. So this speech by the prime minister tomorrow is hotly uh, watched for. Um, that's about it for right now. I've gone on for half an hour, Maya. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about, but I hope this covers the hot spots and it is integrated in a way that makes a little bit more sense to those of you who are following the news. Thank you very much for staying tuned, for being with us every every week. Maya, this is episode what, 85, 86? 87. Wow. Did you hear me? 87, yes. Yeah. We are steadily heading, you know, to the 100th uh, <laughs> episode, but we still have a long way to go until there. So thank you for uh, this briefing. And uh, well, now let's move to Clubhouse and continue there. Uh, Great. Now. Okay. Thank you, Maya. So thank you, Timothy, and I'll see you on the other side. See you on the other side. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in.